Welcome to the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 031. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. And welcome back to the Veterinary Project Podcast. You are joined by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, John. Hey, you're wearing the same shirt as last time. Amazing how that <laughs> happens, isn't it? <laughs> how are you feeling today? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling very good. I'm um, really been hustling. It's it's been um, almost too much. I'm ha- I'll be looking forward to the weekend um, to to take some time off, but it's been a very busy week. That's good. Building that momentum and carrying it forward, right? That's the plan. Um, for me, I had I had some apartment buildings that that hit my desk, um, and in my business, it's kind of hurry up and wait, okay. right? Like nothing will happen for weeks and weeks, and maybe even months. And then when it's time to, to go and potentially buy something, you got to get on it. So that's what, what I'm at. Oh, we're going to get into that at some point in this future. I think the veterinary listeners need to understand what Michael Bug does. Good. Once they figure it out, they can let me know. Cause <laughs> <laughs> that goes to one of our questions at the end. Hey, what do we think you do for yeah. a living? Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, we've got a great conversation happening here today with Dr. Steve Boyer. Before we get into that, our quick tip. Okay, today's uh, quick tip is uh, maybe just something to, to pause when, when you're hitting a new situation, and it's to always ask yourself, what is my willingness to learn? Like my willingness to let go of an old idea and adopt a new one. In this conversation with Steve, uh, we actually dive down a tangent talking about maybe like male ego, if we want to call it that, and some of the traditional things that we've held on to. Um, and you have to let go of that and be willing to learn new ways. And then when we dive into technology, um, you know, technology is changing life so much. So in all areas of your life, that's a key question I try to ask myself is, what is my willingness to learn here? You know, like eliminate the ignorance, be open to new ideas, let go of the judgment and, and, and see where it takes you. And I mean, if the answer at, at the end of that rabbit hole is, you know what? No, this, I don't stand for this. That's fine. At least you explored it. I love it, Mike. So relevant in my life right now. And I always find when I actually do let go, cause I can be a stubborn ass sometimes my life actually gets better. So I've, I had not noticed shocking. I know you'd notice <laughs> In the essence of time, I'm getting off that old track. <laughs> we are joined today by Dr. Steve Boyer. And Dr. Steve Boyer, he is a veterinarian born and raised in Calgary. Grew up with a passion for animals. Always knew he wanted to work with them. He graduated from the University of Calgary's Faculty of Veterinary Medicine in 2013 and jump-started his career in a busy 24-hour emergency hospital in Calgary. He worked in a combination of days, evenings, and overnights for a year and a half, and then moved into primary care where he's been since. Over the past few years, he's developed an interest in telemedicine, and in 2020, co-founded Vetsy, a veterinary telemedicine company. Steve feels there's a significant opportunity in the veterinary industry to utilize technology to improve the veterinary client-patient interaction. With the current shortage of veterinarians and technologists, combined with the increase in pet ownership, there is too much pressure on the industry. Steve hopes that with more innovation and embracing change in how we practice, more pets can get the help they need without the burnout and stress that often comes with being a veterinary professional. I put this out there right away. I am an advisor with Vetsy. I love what they're doing. And in this conversation, we do not go into just pure Betsy, but more of a discussion around telemedicine and telehealth. 
We start off this conversation actually going right back to his time in 24-7 emergency care, what that looked like to him, burnout, and really identifying consciously steps that he needed to move forward to step back from his 40-hour, 50-hour, 60-hour work weeks as a veterinarian to what he's doing today when it evolves around real estate, Vetsy, tech startup, being a veterinarian, as well as being just an awesome all-around guy. So without further ado, Dr. Steve Boyer. Steve, thanks for joining us this morning on the Veterinary Project podcast. Uh, really excited to have you on here. We have a lot to go through. Uh, there is no doubt about it. We're going to be able to cover 35 minutes. Uh, and especially, I'm excited about this for where you are in your career and some of the conscious choices you've made over the last couple of years, even in our you know five-minute pre-talk here before getting on to recording, uh, we've got a lot of info to go into. So I think for our listeners that aren't familiar with you, we've already gone through your introduction. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and where you find yourself in your career right now. Well, first off, very uh, honored to be on uh, with you guys. I've, I've actually never been on a podcast before, so this is a first for me. I'm pumped about it. And uh, I think we have a lot to talk about, uh, you know, in the, in the, the pre-chat. You know, he, I think we have a lot in common and we all share similar values. And um, so I think this will be great and, and uh, happy to share my story with you guys. And, uh, you know, right now, I, I mean, I, I, um, I find myself in my career in kind of an interesting spot where, you know, you start out as a veterinarian, uh, kind of being, being thrown to the wolves, I think a lot of a lot of the times here and, um, you know, that you manage that for a few years, and you kind of learn and evolve as a veterinarian and kind of figure out what you like, what you don't like, and what you can handle what you can't handle. And for me, I, I identified, you know, fa fairly early on that um, this the pace of it is is a lot. And it's hard on the body hard on the mind. And so I've kind of evolved over the past few years into um, finding a balance where I I'm still a veterinarian, you know, at least probably 30 hours a week. And uh, but I've I've uh, took an, I've, I've taken on uh, kind of some side hustles and other projects that uh, pique my interest and uh, are helping me financially. And I think that's, uh, you know, for me, a, a, a big part of where I'm at in my life is finding that balance and, uh, you know, making sure that I can have longevity in the career because it's a, it's a challenging career. So let's jump into that. You started off straight out of school. You didn't do an internship or residency and you ended up at a very busy 24 seven of which we're very, both very uh, familiar with. You end up on nighttime rotations, So overnight rotations, I believe you had said within the first four months of your career, is that correct? Yeah, so the the job was kind of interesting. It was it was kind of a, a quasi internship that myself and a couple of my um, my colleagues were rotating through, uh, days, evenings, and nights, and the three of us would would rotate through those, and um, and then and then one of my colleagues uh, went to another practice. So then there was two of us, and they just put us straight on the night shift rotation. So I was, I was out of vet school for, um, you know, only four months and, uh, thrown into to night shifts. And, uh, that was, that was eye opening for me. And I, I, I don't regret it because I learned a ton. I think when you're thrown into those situations, you, you, you're forced to learn fast and yeah. make decisions and learn from them and make mistakes. And, uh, so I don't regret it. Uh, but I, I learned from it in the sense that, um, you know, I know I probably don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> you know, I don't, I think my, my year of working night shifts was enough for me. Um, but I, yeah, grateful for the experience, learned a lot from it and, uh, helped me realize pretty quickly that I wanted to work, uh, you know, when the sun was up and, uh, and, and more primary care. Now, something interesting you told me was that you, you learn very quickly on, um, who you like to work with. I've worked the night shift. I've worked the night shift at that clinic and you're on your own. You know, you have a very skeleton crew. You're a very tight crew, but there's not a lot of people to reach out to depend on, et cetera. Um, uh, how long or how, yeah. How long into your, your stint there, did you figure out, or did you, you find out what your groove needed to look like? And once you did figure that out, how long did it take to get out of night shifts into something that you were more, um, recognizing that you could do longer term? Well, I, I think I found my groove fairly quickly. And I, and part of that, I, um, I give credit to my colleagues. I mean, the thing about the night shift at the, the, the 24 hour practice I was at is that there's, 
the evening vet is often there till two, three or four in the morning. Right. And they're experienced those evening emergency vets, they know a ton and they are so experienced. So man, I leaned on them a ton for, for help and, and they were used to it. They would, they would help me with cases. And so probably within two or three months of that, I felt like I had a couple of years experience as a vet. Like that's how I felt. I was like, I'm ready to rock and roll here. Of course, things come in that you, you, you know, you're not equipped for or prepared for, but you kind of know how to figure things out and uh, where to look up answers and, and you, you can kind of get through the night. So I would say I got my groove, you know, maybe six months into being a vet. Um, and then, you know, from there it was, of, of course, you're always learning and evolving, but I felt pretty comfortable with my skill set and, and, uh, and then, you know, a few months after that is kind of when I started to realize, I think I would like primary care with the occasional emergency um, in a daytime role. Yeah. As opposed to just being a strict emergency or that yeah, yeah 60, 40 yeah. split emerge GP, yeah, which is quite different than the normal practice. Yeah, for sure. I, I actually get a kick out of the occasional emergency. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do find now with being in primary care for many, many years, um, you're a little bit out of touch with some of the emergencies. And, you know, one of the things I struggled with in my career is feeling as though, you know, I, you, you do what you can to help these pets, but a part of you wonders, would this pet have better care if they were elsewhere with a more experienced vet? And that's been a, that's been a struggle I've had my whole career is, you know, you want to do the best you can, but you, you know, your own limitations and, and it's kind of a, you know, I'm, I know that I'm putting limitations on myself in that sense, but I, it's, it's the truth. And, and as much as you want to help and, and be there, you know, a party is always like, should, should these, should these pets be at a referral 24 hour specialty hospital, you know? And, um, and so when you're not seeing as many emergencies, you don't have that experience. And so that's a struggle I've always had, but, um, of course, you know, when something comes in and you're the one in, in charge, you, you do what you got to do to help. So I'm going to dive deep into that for a second. Do you think that struggle is as a measure of your personality and your personality style as it relates to perfectionism, wanting to do the best every time, hundred percent. Do you think it's a measure of your schooling and what you're set up for in terms of professors and moving into a referral center? Or do you think it was a setup potentially because of where you live in that we do have two very good, busy tertiary centers more now, but at that point that you could move things to and the expectations were higher. It's a big deal. Yeah. I, I think, I think it's multifactorial. I think it's probably all the above that, you know, a part of it is my personality that I, I'm a, I'm a bit of a perfectionist and I really want to do the best I can every time. And I don't like failure. And I think pretty much every vet is like that. Um, so that's a component for sure. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we live in an area where there's, we have phenomenal uh, veterinarians in the city here and, and, and they're not that far away. And so, um, you know, they're accessible. I mean, we're pretty busy these days and there's a, a backlog of care, I think. And, but, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's a combination of, of things and hopefully, you know, in time, you know, that, that will improve and change, but I think there's always going to be, you know, that, uh, that little voice in the back of your head, you know, that's saying, you know, can you handle this? Can you do this? That's tough. And has your voice quietened over time or is it still right up there in the front and center? Yeah, it's quiet. It's, it, it's quieter now. I, I, I definitely, I think early on you're, you're, you know, green behind the ears. And so you, you know, you worry about things a little bit more and with more experience, you've seen more cases and, um, so I think it's better now. I think it's a lot better now. And, and it's, I would say actually it's, it's pretty rare when a case comes in where I feel like I can't provide value. Excellent. Yeah. And that's again, measure of time, experience, competencies, all of the above. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. That's fantastic. Yeah. I, I want to just jump in. I mean, first off, I think yet yeah, that's great awareness. Mm-hmm. How, how early on you recognized that in yourself. I do have a question because I have never worked overnights at a, at a large emergency center. So the piece about that desire to work with the team, can you dive into that a bit? And I know for me and, and COVID amplified it, what I'm doing right now, I work from home and I have like a craving to be a part of a team. So can you maybe yep. dive into that a little bit? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm a social person, so I, I like working with a team and, and my current role right now, there's several other veterinarians I work with and we're always 
getting each other's opinions. There's no shame. We ask each other no. questions all the time. And, and I love that. However, I think sometimes it can be a little bit limiting because then you almost rely upon that. It, you know, when you're in a really big hospital and, a, uh, you know, there's, there's tons of people around you, you know, you, you maybe lean on that a little bit too much sometimes, I think. But uh, for myself, um, you know, where I'm at now, there's a, you know, there's a couple vets there usually. And so it's, I think that's the perfect number. Um, we're all experienced. So we help each other out on, on the occasional case that's a challenge. I like working as a team because I'm a social person um, and, and I think I, I thrive in those situations um, being, you know, all by myself. Um, I think, you know, you, you're forced to learn and forced to figure things out and that's a benefit in its own. But uh, personally, I like, uh, I like working with the team. Great question. Now you talk about um, moving from a merge into a GP setting and also looking at as you're going a couple of years in around the stresses of being a veterinarian and burnout. Pretty yeah. common themes, but one that we did touch upon. Tell us what that looked like from your perspective, Steve. Yeah, it, it's a it's an important it's an important topic for sure. I mean, we we know we're in a tough industry, and um, I, I think you know the veterinary industry attracts certain types of people. And they're more prone to, to, you know, stress and burnout and compassion fatigue and such. And then it's, and then of course it's a, a, a the nature of the beast, the, 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 the industry we're in. And so for me, I experienced it. Um, I'll be completely upfront about it. Many times in my career, I experienced burnout and compassion fatigue, and you have to go through a few of those to really recognize and take a step back and go, okay, I got to start identifying when this is, when the signs are here so that I can make a change and do something about it. And, um, it can really take a toll on you. And so for me, I, I, I would say I realized maybe four or five years into my career that, uh, it was taking a big toll and I needed to, I needed to make an, a, a big change to, um, to combat that and to minimize, you know, the burnout and the, and, and the, the stress that, that the job has, because I don't, I don't think, I don't think people really realize the, the, the life of a vet, you know, we, we work really, really hard. We put our hearts on our sleeves and, and uh, blood, sweat, and tears. And uh, you know, it's not all just playing with puppies and kittens. And, you know, so I, I think, I think uh, it's, it's a stressful industry, but if you, if you can identify when you're feeling bad, when you're feeling stressful and you can actively make changes in your life, and do something about it, you'll have a lot more, it'll be more sustainable for you. Yep. So I'm going to jump into something that we didn't even test in the pre-recording. All three of us are dudes. Common knowledge, I'm putting it out there. It's easy for us to mask that. It's easy for us to hide and just try and continue to grow. And again, I'm, I'm totally generalizing. Someone can nail me in the comments and go, that's not right, etc. But as a general rule, it's easier for us guys to do that and expectations with that. Um, did you find yourself doing that at all? And, or were you pretty conscious early on that, Hey, I've got to make it, I've got to make a change here and here's some steps I need to do. Yeah, I know. I, I agree with that. I think that, um, you know, I don't know if it's our upbringing or what, or what the reason is behind it, but you know, I would say early on in my career, I, I hid my emotions more and I, I just tried to, you know, uh, kind of put a straight face on and, and, and do the work. And, and now later in my career, uh, I've, I've snuck into the washroom and cried many, many times over cases. And it's like, you just become, I think more vulnerable and more emotional and, and, uh, more in tune with your emotions when, you know, as you, as you carry on in your career and you start to be more, you know, in tune with your, with, with, with how you're feeling. And, um, and that's just the reality of the, of the, the job we're in. It's, there's some really tough times and, um, you sometimes got to let it out and you got to identify when you're, yeah, when you're not feeling great. And I think for, for us guys, yeah, we, we probably grew up, most of us probably grew up, you know, trying to be all, you know, tough and, and, uh, just kind of pull up your sleeves and get the job done and, and move on. And, you know, but um, I think you have to have you have to have some emotions in this job. Yeah, and I, and I want to jump in. Um, you know, I would kind of argue, Jonathan. I this is just me speaking of of myself. Is that it, easy? Wasn't quite the correct word. Like it wasn't easy 
but it was almost like expected that you're not going to show it. Like, yeah. do not externalize this. Do not complain. Don't show uh, like quote unquote weakness or emotion. Exactly. Like Steve said. Um, and I, I don't know where that comes from. And I mean, that is changing. Um, you know, at, like as I grew up, I'm, I'm what, 36 years old. So I grew up in like the eighties, nineties and sort of that idea of, yeah, be, be a man, like toughen up that kind of uh, philosophy. So I, I, it wasn't easy. It was just all happening internally, not on the surface. Fair point. Completely agree with you. And kudos to you, Steve, for saying that. Cause that is, that's the reality of our, our world. Yeah. And I think, I think the more you, the more you fight that and, and try to just, uh, you know, get the job done and, and, yeah. and don't recognize that, you know, how you're feeling, uh, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna burn out faster, you know, and it's going to take its toll on you. Um, and, and so I think it's really important for, for veterinarians, anyone in general to identify when you're, when you're not feeling very good and, and do something about it. Don't just sit back and, and you know, you got to, take action and, and make a change and do something about it. Yeah. I remember doing my fifth euthanasia once in an emergency setting in one day and just fe- how numb did that feel? And what, you know, we talked about it, you know, what, what do you do? You can't think anymore and, and yeah. that's not good. You can't emotionally rationalize it. That's not good. And um, it's not good to then take it out in other ways, as we've talked about in previous podcasts with um, consumption of other goods could, yeah, totally. Well, and, and, and when you go through those moments and then you reflect upon it and you go, man, like I, that was a really sad case. And I was just stone cold numb, like something's wrong with me. And then, yeah. you know, that's you're you're too far gone. Like yeah. you, you needed to identify months ago that something was going on and you weren't feeling right because that's, that's, I think that's, you know, compassion fatigue and you need a break and, you know, you need to reset yourself. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Stepping a little bit forward here, Steve, you're a few years into your career and the entrepreneurial itch, the finance itch, the real estate, whatever you want to speak about it, um, kicks into gear. And I think this is really cool, very interesting and something that I'm hearing with a lot more veterinarians this, these days. Um, tell us a little bit more about the, the inception of looking outside of veterinary medicine for fulfillment, for gratification, for lifestyle, earning money, all of the above. What does that look like? Yeah. So for me, I, well, I think not just for me, for a lot of, a lot of veterinarians, you know, you you go to school for, you go to school for like six plus years. For me, it was eight years, you know, four years of undergrad uh, and then four years of vet school. And you graduate with usually quite a bit of debt, often six figures of debt. And then you, you get your first job. And like, for me, my first job, I was offered $55,000 for my first job. I'm like, you know, you can imagine my disappointment when I just spent eight years of post-secondary and I had incurred all this debt and I was offered a job for that. I'm like, how am I going to get ahead in life? You know, how am I going to do this? And, and so, but you just kind of, you just, you take the job and you just start working and, you know, veterinarians, we're not, we're not super wealthy people. We don't, you know, we, it's, it's a decent pay, but it's certainly not what people think it is. And it's very difficult to get ahead and it's difficult to finance the life you want to live. And I realized that probably three or four years ago. And I, and I, I kind of said to myself, I, you know, I, how things have to change. I have to create more revenue streams and more income streams for myself because otherwise you're trapped, you're trapped and you have to work more which brings on more stress um, to make more money. And it's, it's this cycle, this pattern. And so I, I kind of took a step back a few years ago and I said, okay, what are some of my other interests? Well, I, I have this entrepreneurial drive. Um, I've always wanted to be a business owner. I love being a veterinarian. I want to help animals, but I know that it's not sustainable for me, you know, 40, 50, 60 hours a week. I just, I, I was recognizing that something needed to change. So yeah, so I decided, you know, a few years ago that I, 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 I had an interest in real estate. And so I wanted to get involved there and, and uh, you know, develop a bit of a portfolio of, of rental incomes. And I'm just scratching the surface there, which is exciting for me. Um, and then starting a company and I had an interest in telemedicine. And so I started a telemedicine company and that 
that was another kind of a route for me as well. So now I'm in a kind of a funny balance where I, I kind of have three things on the go with my, you know, I'm a veterinarian for, you know, three days a week, um, which is my, the majority of my, my income. I'm trying to build up a bit of a, a real estate portfolio. I have a rental income, a rental property now, and then I'm working on this company, uh, this, uh, this telemedicine company. And, and, um, and hopefully, you know, that will grow into a really successful business that I can, uh, that I can spend even more time on and, and, and grow and, and, and scale. Uh, yeah. I want to jump in. Cause I know we're going to go into telemedicine, telehealth. Can you comment Steve on how things have changed from five days a week versus three days a week? You know, yes. like th this idea of full-time versus part-time. And I know that can look like anything, but that's a really similar experience to what I had. I went from five days a week down to three days a week. Um, so I'd love to hear your comments on that. Cause I do see this come up a ton. And I, I believe like the industry is moving that way where it'll be more normal to work your sort of three days or your three shifts versus five days. Yeah. It's a massive change. I was, I could not do, I could not do the, the, the volume and the time and the stress of, you know, of, of the five, five and a half, six days, even four days. I did four days a week for a while, but those are, you know, how it is in, in the vet world, it's, they're 10 to 12 hour days. And so, and then you bring it home with you. It's not done when you, you know, you bring it home with you. You're thinking about your cases, you're getting pinged, you know, on your phone, questions are coming in. It's 24 hours as being a vet, right? So, so night and day change going from uh, five days a week to three days a week. There's still long days, but man, the time, the time that you have off to decompress, to focus on some other things, to work on some of the, the other passions you have in your life um, is, is huge. And I know that I'll last much longer in this career and be much more fulfilled in this career, um, having a better balance. Yeah. So talking to the both of you, cause I didn't do the same step, but I, I completely changed within the veterinary industry. So I'd love to hear feedback from the both of you. Um, Mike, I think I remember you getting quite a bit of pushback when you went down in hours. Well, absolutely. You like, I, I definitely did. Um, and I was going to chime in when we were talking more about like some of the, the traditional like male stresses and one thing, and I mean, this is, this is traditional thinking. Like it certainly maybe doesn't apply anymore, but it, I mean, facts are fact. Like it, this is how I felt where it's like, you're traditionally supposed to be the breadwinner, right? You're supposed to go out and make like more than a hundred grand a year and provide for the family. Um, you know, and there's that kind of thing weighing on you where you're like, well, obviously if I go down to part-time, I'm working less, I'm producing less, I'm going to bring home less money. Right. And that really messed with my mind a lot about, you know, like, are you being worthy or, you know, you know, that kind of thing. And I mean, I've long gotten over that. Um, but anyway, yeah, I got lots of pushback because it's just not normal or it wasn't at the time. And that's where I go, Steve, how did that feel on your end? Did that yeah, occur or was it? I mean, sort of, I, 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 I agree that, you know, it, it didn't, you know, it may not seem normal to, to do that, but I'm very fortunate because, uh, you know, m my wife is, is very much a hard worker and, and has a, has a great job. And so, you know, I, I definitely, you know, there's a support there, of course. And, um, you know, we're living in a world now where it's, it's not all uh, on the male, right. In the, in the relationship. So it's, it, things are, are changed and rightly so. And, and so I, I, of course, for me, my situation, I felt a little bit of relief in that sense. I didn't feel that immense pressure from dropping from five days to four days to three days. Um, and, and, you know, I've also been really lucky that the, that the, the current job that I have, my colleagues and my boss and manager, they're very supportive and they, they, um, they recognize it too. And we, we all experience stress and, and um, you know, in, in the job and, and it can be tough at times. So they, they understand that, you know, they, they want me to last as long as I can in the career and they do, they want to last as long as they can. And so finding that balance is really important. So, I would say it was uh, it wasn't it wasn't that tough of a decision for me to drop down the finances. Of course, I think is a big one, Mike. You, you touched upon that. I mean, you you wonder you worry a little bit about that, but um, you know you can you can structure it. Uh, you know, with if if you have a, a good clinic you're working at, um, so that maybe you're seeing a few more appointments in the days that you're working. And um, so for me, it was wasn't a big hit. 
Um, and, and like I said before, I, I, I'm working on other revenue streams, right? I'm trying to use what, what little money I have and plant seeds and have them grow and be more assets for me down the road. Well, let's talk about those seeds. You had mentioned that entrepreneurial wanted to start a business, not the traditional business from a veterinary standpoint in terms of going into ownership. You mentioned telemedicine. Where did this interest start? And walk us through a little bit about the evolution. Now, I'm really excited to hear this because you're in a true tech startup as a veterinarian in 2021. How did that come to be? Well, what's funny is that I'm like, you know, you talk to some of my, my colleagues previously and they'd be like, Steve's in a tech startup. Like I'm not very tech savvy. Right. But I have learned a lot over the past year and um, year and a half. And, and so, so the, the start of it really, it's a combination of things. One is, you know, I, I think technology is the future. I think we can all agree that that's going to be a big part of our future. Two, you know, I, I, I found that I was, you know, struggling with, uh, with uh, the, the challenges of, of being a vet five days a week and the stress of it and thinking, what can we do to alleviate some of these, these stressors? Uh, three is that we have a shortage of veterinarians right now. And, and uh, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, pet ownership, there's more pet ownership. So access to, to senior vet is, is, a, is sometimes a struggle. So and, 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 and I think the combination of, the th- of, of all those basically was kind of where my interest in telemedicine came yeah. from and understanding that there's, you know, accessibility is really, really important. And we're in a client facing industry and you, you develop, a, you'll, you'll get a, a strong clientele and a, a lot of respect from your clients and they'll come back to see you if they can get a hold of you and you can help them you know, kind of when they need help, you know, if, if they don't hear from you for a week or 10 days, um, they're probably going to go elsewhere. So, so finding a way to be accessible to your clients, but not have, not have it um, negatively impact you and stress you out. You know, when, when you're, when you're getting messages and phone calls on your weekends and evenings, and you're not getting anything for it, 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 it adds to the stress. And eventually you kind of go, Oh, man, like, is this what I, is this what I signed up for? But through technology, there's, you know, there's ways that you can do this. And with, I think with telemedicine, there's a way that you can, you know, have a platform that you can be accessible to your clients, but you're not giving away all your time for free. You know, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll pay for it. Um, or it's, it's an easy interface where you can connect with them and, and it's not this phone tag all day long or, you know, so I, I just think that there's ways with technology to improve that client interaction, uh, improve patient care, um, and reduce the amount of stress that, that, that veterinarians incur. Mm-hmm. Jonathan, I want to jump in here. Cause this, this is really interesting when I, I'm hearing this here for the first time and yep. it's, you have the accessibility and it, it can be kind of counterintuitive to setting boundaries. And Rosalie and I talk about this a lot. She runs her own business and, you know, as a business owner, and, and in, a, in a way, you can consider yourself as a vet because they're, they're your clients, like you're building your client yeah. base. You have to be accessible. And it, exactly what you said, like people will move on if they're not getting a timely response. Um, so this is really interesting how technology can come in and provide that sort of immediate touch point, even if it's just to say, hey, you know what? I've heard your concern and and this is something that can wait until Monday. Why don't you book in? Often that's enough to alleviate concerns, right? Because the client just wants to know because yeah. because they don't know. Like, is this a dire emergency? And if you can just calm that down. So this is cool how how technology can kind of balance that accessibility and boundaries. Yeah, and I, I, it's a fine line, I think. Like, you know, we we have to be careful that we're that we're not, you know. 24 hours a day, you know, on call and, and getting all these messages. And, and, uh, but I think if you can, if you can have a way that, that clients can access you or access someone in your clinic, a veterinary professional that can provide that guidance, that peace of mind. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's the way to go because we need to be accessible to our clients, but we also need to have a way to, to, like, I would much rather, I would much rather have a, you know, an app on my phone or a platform where I can, text or communicate or um, schedule a quick video call with a client and, 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 and have it monetized um, as opposed to 
picking up the phone, phone tag in between every appointment, trying to get a hold of a client, being 20 minutes late for my appointment because I'm stuck on the phone. Like, you know, that I think that adds stress. And so, so I think there's a, I think there's a, a balance there and, but it is a bit of a fine line because you have to protect your veterinarians and your veterinary staff. Um, you know, but you also need to be there for your clients. Such a fine line and, and such an interesting place we are in the evolution of this. Uh, you know, I sit on council with the ABV May, regulator within Alberta. We have to also be cognizant of what's there from a legal standpoint for what is described as veterinary medicine, which is very specific when you look at the different profession acts across whether it's the states or provinces. I think a differentiator, and we need to bring this up, is uh, Steve, you know, you're right in the middle of this. What is the difference between telehealth and telemedicine? Because these words are thrown out interchangeably right now all over veterinary medicine and they aren't the same thing yeah t- i think of it as i think of it as telehealth being this big broad umbrella term that essentially is providing um anything that can really be uh, uh related to to health um through remote means and so online resources emails texting calling um videos um and just general health telemedicine is like the practice of medicine remotely essentially. Mm -hmm. So telemedicine is kind of underneath this telehealth uh, term. And so telehealth has been around for a very long, very long time as as has telemedicine. I mean, you know, large animal veterinarians have been on the phone with producers and farmers for, for decades providing advice and, 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 and guidance and such. And so, so yeah, so telehealth more broad term, which encompasses, um, you know, general health of, and welfare um, through, through remote means. And then telemedicine is more focused on, you know, prescribing, diagnosing, prognosing um, through remote means, whether that be email, text, calling videos. Um, yeah. Excellent. So you've started a company, you have a co-founder, Vetsy, where you guys are at the forefront of this telemedicine revolution, if you want to call it, you know, call it what you may. And there's a lot of proponents for it and opponents to it. And there's a mm-hmm. lot of people in the middle. Yeah. What do you say to those that is the vast majority of us as veterinarians right now that don't really know which side to fall on? I, I think my answer or what I would say to them is that um, you probably are already practicing some form of of telehealth for sure telehealth and and telemedicine um when you're when you're calling your clients and when you're looking at uh photos that they've emailed to you um any sort of remote care that you've provided you're already doing it and so why not why not take that and and make it more robust and more um more kind of day-to-day and and more efficient and so veterinarians were always there's always going to be a time and a place for a physical exam that's just a that's just a given. There's always going to be those cases you have to palpate an abdomen where you have to auscultate their heart. I mean, that's never going to. I don't think that'll ever go away. But there's there's definitely a place for being able to provide value and help clients remotely. And so, and you can do a lot by by seeing a, an animal. I had a case a couple of weeks ago of this huge mastiff that is extremely aggressive. And every time they come in, it takes three or four rounds of sedation to get them to the point where I can even put my hands on this dog. And honestly, I do, it would be much better if I could just do a a telemedicine consultation with them where I get to video this dog in in its own environment. Um, I can ask the owner to do lots of things, lift up the lips, show me the gums, um, you know, counter respirate, feel for a pulse. Like there's lots you can do. And so I tell any veterinarian that's kind of on the fence is that, well, first of all, you probably are already doing some telemedicine. And so why not embrace it a little bit more and always just stick to your gut. If you're, if you're on the phone with a client or if you're doing a a virtual consultation, or if you're responding to an email and something doesn't feel right and you're thinking, "Mm, I need to see this pet. Fine. Just call them, tell them to come in and, and, and book a consultation and you'll see them. I mean, we do that anyway. So it's no different when, when, you, when you think about telemedicine. I think, I think often veterinarians are a bit scared to go down that, 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 uh, that road, but it, it shouldn't be scary. I mean, you're just practicing medicine, practic- providing general advice and guidance um, you know, within, within the scope that you're comfortable with. And if things feel wrong, it probably is. Call them in for an exam. Oh, that's very, very cool. Yeah. I'll, I'll say to the scope of practice as well as the regular guy, the guy in council, um, we have to follow the rules of the land. 
Yeah, it's really sure. important. And those rules of land are there for protection. And again, this is a, a great discussion happening in the veterinary world right now as to where are those rules and what do they look like? And um, right now it's up to every province and states and AVMA and the CVMA and helping determine that. And I'm only speaking North American wide. I'm not as cognizant into what's happening in Europe and beyond. Yeah, well, that's very true. And, and I think for me, the, what it comes down to is, is if you are, if you are, if you're practicing and you're, you're providing advice, you're talking to a client, maybe you don't know this client, maybe you've never yeah. seen them before. What it comes down to is, is if you think your peers would judge you on what you're on your decision-making, then there's probably a, there's probably a problem there. But if, if, if you're practicing and your peers would go, yeah, no, that's legit. That's, that's what I would have done. Then you're probably fine. The, the big thing with, um, with the different regulations out there is, is within the VCPR, the veterinary client patient relationship. And I'll just touch upon that really quickly because I think it's important. Yep. So it, in where we are, you have to have a veterinary client patient relationship. You have to have that existing relationship with the client and have a good understanding of the, the, the health and well being of that pet to be able to prescribe diagnose prognose through, through telemedicine means. And so that's really, really important. And that should be, I think the baseline, I think that for going forward, if you're one of those vets that's on the fence and you want to dabble in telemedicine, do it within your VCPR. You pick the pick the the good clients and patients that you have that you know you trust you 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 understand their health and and you know uh, prescribe diagnose and and prognose within reason you know with the, with those with those cases. But if you don't have a VCPR. It's really just a general advice and guidance, which I will add can be a huge value. And a lot of times that's all we're doing is providing a general advice and, and guidance. So, um, so I think there's, there's a lot of ways where veterinarians can, can help, um, with help, help clients and, and patients through telehealth or telemedicine uh, with or without a VCPR. You just kind of have to know the boundaries. Awesome. Uh, I want to switch gears very quickly. Sure. Yanks our time, which I knew we were going to do today. You're co-founder in a growing tech company as a veterinarian in Canada. Such a cool thing, Steve, um, for your journey and where you're at right now. Tell us about some of the high points. Tell us about some of the low points. This is really neat. Not something that many get to be involved with. What does that look like? It's, uh, it's very, very busy. <laughs> That's, uh, <laughs> it's extremely busy. I mean, it's, being in a, in a startup is a, is a full-time, a full-time job uh, without a doubt. And so, you know, and then you're balancing, you know, your life outside of that as well. And so it's exciting. I'm learning a ton. It's the busiest I've ever been in my life without a doubt, and hopefully will ever be in my life. Um, but I, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity. I, I have a great uh, few co-founders that are, are uh, in the threads of the startup world and, and very entrepreneurial and very tech savvy. And they're teaching me a ton, the highs and lows, you know, the highs, I think for me are the constant learning every day we're making progress. Um, you know, we, we send each other wins of the day and, you know, it's just, a, it's motivating. We, we pump each other's tires, you know, we, we just, we, we're excited and, and it's a, it's we we feel like we're on the forefront of something pretty special. Um, the lows are that sometimes sometimes it's 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 very difficult to to make some of the progress you want to make and or you know things are it's harder to to track down veterinarians or uh, more expensive to build you know the technology than you thought or you're having um, technology bugs or hit, hiccups and issues so those are kind of the lows and but overall I think you know it's growth every day it's learning every day it's super fun to be a part of and and uh, you know, it's, you know, it'll continue to be very busy for probably many, many years, but that's, that's, that's kind of, uh, the nature of the game. Yep. That's what you signed up for and that's what you're yep. doing and you're doing something different. Yep. And I think technology is the future. So I think it's, it's, it's fun to be a part of. I'm curious, Steve, um, cause, cause the entrepreneurial life is not for everyone. Was there any hints in your childhood, uh, that, that, you know, you were drawn to that? Yeah, you know what? It's it, and maybe this isn't something I should be proud of, but I've never been a I've never been the type of person that necessarily likes to take a lot of direction from someone. <laughs> so I kind of like to have control and and um, you know kind of dictate my life and and so 
I, I feel like, I feel like, you know, entrepreneurialism was maybe ingrained in me from a young age. Cause I just, I wanted to do things my way. And, and uh, I've always been a pretty motivated person and pretty driven. And um, you know, if I put my mind to something like, it's going to happen. Like I'm going to do it. And so being getting into vet school was, was a good example. I was never a, a top student. I, you know, I, I didn't pay attention in, in uh, elementary, junior high and high school. Like it wasn't until, you know, maybe, you know, grades 10 or 11, where I was like, maybe veterinarian would be a, a good career for me. And, and then I looked at my grades and went, oof, something's got to change here. So, so I, I've never been that, that uh, strong academically. So I had to work extremely hard to get the good grades and get into vet school. And so I, th- I think it's just ingrained in me from a young age. And I like to have control over my day to day. And, and uh, the thought of building something from zero to one is really exciting. And um, yeah, so I, th- I think, yeah, just part of who I am. Awesome. Well, with that, uh, so many other avenues we could go into, but we can't today. So we are going to switch over and we're going to switch to our impact round. And we have a series of short questions for you, Steve, that uh, you can answer as quickly or as long as you would like. And our first question for our impact round is, are you a cat or a dog person? Love both, but I'm a dog person. But he's going the other way. <laughs> I know you guys are cat people, uh, but I'm a dog person. Nice. True or false? I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian since I was a kid. False. I knew I wanted to work with animals since I was a kid. Uh, grew up, uh, I'm just going to plug Steve Irwin, huge crocodile hunter fan growing up. That was like, you know, my life growing up. I was, he was a huge influence on me. So I knew I wanted to work with animals and I wanted to be like him, you know, for some time. And, um, and then, you know, eventually it kind of thought, Hey, I, maybe I could, I, I'm interested in medicine. So veterinary medicine, you know, probably around the high school, uh, age is when I decided I wanted to go that route. Nice. How would your friends describe what you do for a living? Oh, well, I have, uh, most of my friends are tradesmen, so they would probably say something inappropriate. Like he just sticks his fingers up dogs butts all day. Uh, but I, I think some of my friends just would, would say that I, you know, my day is very, very busy. He's, uh, he's, he's wearing a lot of hats. Um, and, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's a vet. That's what they would say. It is shocking how much we get that response of, of fingers or arms going up things. <laughs> you know what it is? One of my buddies, uh, his dog had anal gland issues. And, uh, so I had to go over there one day and express those glands. And that was early on in my career. And, you know, for now on, I'll, I'll just be that guy that, uh, that's all I do every day. <laughs> Squishes yeah. bums. <laughs> Steve, what's your favorite hobby? Ooh, I have a few hobbies, probably my favorite, um, picking up the guitar, singing a favorite tune. Um, a close second would be building, building something, construction, or playing some hockey or golf. Nice. What in this world are you most grateful for? Oh, the health and love of my, of my uh, family and friends, my loved ones. That's, uh, that's everything. Awesome. Well, with that, we're coming to a close of another episode of our veterinary project podcast steve this has been a pleasure uh you know we got deep and then we're on surface there's so many things that we could have gone down there really appreciate um both your honesty when it relates to some of our prior or early discussion around burnout and um fatigue and then really excited to see where this project goes along the lines of the entrepreneurial um, sense that you have such a strong sense of so really appreciate your time and honesty it was great Oh, like I said, honored to, honored to be here with you guys and, and love chatting with you too. If uh, people want to reach out to you, um, find you on Instagram or find you on social media, I should say, where do they reach out to? Yeah. So uh, you can email me, uh, steve at vetsy.com. You could find me on Instagram. We have a go vetsy Instagram account, um, and our website and, um, and you can even find me personally, uh, on, on Facebook, Steve Boyer, you'll find me on there. So, um, anyway, uh, you want to reach out, uh, happy to chat. Excellent. Mike, any words of closing? No, just thank you again, uh, for sharing your story and for the time. I know, um, you know, in a startup, I've never done a tech startup, but it, as an entrepreneur, your calendar is probably packed. So I really appreciate the time um, and getting to know you has been a great, great chat. Oh, for sure. Uh, great to get to know you too, Mike. And uh, I think we have a lot in common, us three. And uh, I'm sure one of these days we could chat for three, four, five hours easily. 
get a couple beers going with those two. That's right, we're right. gonna have a few beer, and then I I want to hear Steve sing us a song because I'm always so impressed. I have no musical talent. Um, people that can play instruments and sing and do it all together, it's like that's mind blowing to me. Yeah, well, we'll do, we'll do a kumbaya around a fire one of these days. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, Steve, uh, with all of our guests, uh, we leave the last word to you. What message do you want to leave for the veterinary community? Yeah, I would say um, practice resiliency, uh, maintain a positive attitude, express gratitude, and listen to your gut. And if you are feeling stressed out, burnt out, if you're feeling unhappy, it's on you to make a change. And I would strongly encourage you to do so because you only have one life to live. I know that's cliche, but it's, it's on you to make a change to create the best life you can for yourself. Thank you for listening to the Veterinary Project Podcast. As a recap, on behalf of our hosts, the Veterinary Project Podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly. So be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived. If you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know, please like, love, and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing, as we're available on all the usual suspects. If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group. General feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye for now.